Hey there, Mission Control. Welcome back. We're continuing our series on the system overview. And today we're going to talk about light. Let there be light. I just like this bed. This is the only bed we have set up right now with the lights on it. Uh, these are short, um, well not short, they're four foot long lights. There's four of them underneath up here right now. Uh, and if you really wanted to get serious about this, there should be eight underneath of here. That would give you the total amount of PAR. Uh, that's photosynthetically uh, absorbable radiation, P-A-R, PAR for short. And oh yeah, hey, when I was doing the automation series, I forgot to tell you guys. We have a PAR sensor right here. That's part of the automation as well. So that's one of the sensors that we have. It's just attached via Velcro right in the middle of the bed. Uh, anyway, back to lights. Okay, so when we first started off last year, we had uh, light movers going back and forth on a 12 foot uh, piece two by four, back and forth on a bed with a single 200 watt LED uh, going back and forth. And it worked pretty okay, but not enough light. And uh, the light movers ended up jamming up on us. Uh, not very good. Uh, just bad. There's too many moving parts, not necessary. Simplify, simplify, simplify. So we went with this new structure where we have the lights up underneath and we're trying to balance cost and power that's available with the benefits that we get. So before we had the new cover, which is part of our lighting solution, um, we had our old cover, which didn't allow light in really. I mean, you know, it was bright in here, but not like real light that you could actually grow things with. So things got stringy, just not very good. So we put these lights in, did the calculations, figured out how much uh, we would get with these four, did experiments. You can go back and check out those experiments. And basically came down to four grow lights uh, with a reduction in grow bed space, meaning you know, this is area right here that's kind of dark, and then there's this area over here that's kind of light. Well, we're essentially covering a little over 80% of the bed, and we've decided that that's acceptable. So instead of trying to get 100% bed coverage, we went with 80, and then we had to make another decision, and that is, how are you gonna make up the difference? So, we had a custom cover made for this building from the manufacturer that we bought it from, where we actually, uh, what is the right word to say? We utilized, there was a better word, employed? Employed the principles from uh, passive solar greenhouses. If you're unfamiliar with that, go check it out on YouTube. There's lots of videos out there, way better than what I'm gonna do right now. But essentially, if you align your building so that you're going east to west, your southern facing wall, if you're in the northern latitude, or your northern facing wall, if you're in the southern latitude, is the one that's gonna get the most sun. So make sure it lets the light through. Then on the northern side, cover it up, or the southern side, depending if you're in the southern hemisphere, cover it up because you're not gonna get that much sun over there. You're just wasting heat energy over there if you make it all clear. So go with a clear southern and an insulated northern, and then it'll cost you less to heat the whole thing as well, but you get the benefit of natural light coming in the building, which is what we were going for when we put this in. So uh, while we did take a hit in uh, LEDs not covering the entire bed, we're trying to make up the difference with um, the natural light coming in. So now with the new cover in place, we get a lot more light in here. It's pretty awesome. The sun just went down, so getting some good readings for you is, is not gonna be totally practical. Uh, but I do have a, a Lux meter and a PAR meter that are both portable that I can go around and I've taken readings. And essentially we had over a 400% increase in available light in here, which means for everything that's not shaded, because shading is a problem that we have, and we'll talk about that in a future video, but. Uh, for everything that's not shaded, essentially it can grow with natural light. Uh, so really excited about what the natural light of the new cover means for us, uh, but it's not without a cost. Now we have a giant magnifying glass in the summer that we now have to deal with. So going to have to figure that all out, uh, shade cloth, all those types of things. But uh, as far as lighting goes, that was why we chose to go with that. That's number one reason. Number two reason was heat. Uh, like today, right now, if if we hadn't had that, we would have been running a heater in here all day even though the sun was out uh, because it's less than the temperature we need outside. And we know that from experience. <laughs> we did it last year. So now with this new cover, it got up to 90 degrees in here. We had to turn the exhaust fan in to get the heat out uh, and we're in winter time. So really excited about that. Pretty cool. Um, but really, number one reason was lighting. 
So let's get back to uh, these crazy psychedelic looking lights here. You might be wondering why, why are they kind of purplish, pinkish looking here? Why are they not like just normal everyday lights? Well, let's start off with the premise that we have limited amount of electricity out here. We have 40 amps of this entire building. We can up it to 80, but if we do that, then we just essentially take uh, power away from HAB2 because we only have 80 amps available to this entire construction site. So we go with 40 amps. That led us down the path of what's the least amount of energy consuming light option that's available that'll actually work. There's a whole bunch of different lights out there, but most of them don't do very well as far as conserving electricity goes. And you lose a lot of efficiency in those lights because they're not making more light, they just make heat. Um, and we don't need that, definitely don't need it in the summer. In the winter it'd be okay, but not in the summer. So LEDs, uh, are right now the most efficient light source that we have. It converts, it has the highest percentage of converted energy into light with minimal heat. It still has heat loss though, so you have to be concerned with that. Uh, so then the next thing you gotta say is, well, if I'm spending electricity on things, I wanna spend electricity and get the biggest bang for my buck, right? And spending electricity, if I'm spending money on electricity, right? So the reason these lights are kind of purple is because it's just red and blue light coming together. Now, the plants that we love and eat and all those great things that we're trying to grow, they don't need the full spectrum of light. Uh, based on scientific reports that have been coming out of the universities and NASA, NASA's doing the exact same thing here. You only need red and blue. That is the most utilized spectrum of light that the plants need. Now there's also contradictory reports out there that say, yeah, but they still need UV, they still need this, they still need that. But Right now, people that are doing indoor growing are having a lot of success with the LEDs, and you just, you can't beat it as far as the price, as far as the life, as far as uh, the, the cost of running it. LEDs are the most efficient way to go, period, end of story. So we use automation to control these lights as well. In fact, I just got it set up, uh, not more than, well, actually yesterday, I got it set up on this lane again. Uh, the previous system from last year each lane was controlled individually by an automation unit, and this year each lane is controlled by an automation unit. Um, a lot less power and a lot less complex, that's the reason we're doing that. So I just got uh, the lane unit reprogrammed to handle lighting. The lights need to run 16 hours a day, essentially. You need 16 hours of lighting per day. Now in these lower beds here, we need the LEDs on them because they don't have the light coming in from the sun. So these upper ones, they don't need any LEDs on them right now. Uh, they might in the future, depends on how the weather works out, but um, the lower beds, they're shadowed, like this bed over here has a lot of shadowing on it, not a lot of light, so it will need the LEDs. But they need to run 16 hours per day, and uh, that, that's kind of the common, you have different plants, you need different lighting, but 16 hours is kind of the norm, so that's what we have it set to right now. So, uh, how does Mars help us out with this? Well, both la last year we learned it the hard way uh, with the winter that we had, but on Mars, if you think about it, the dust storms, light isn't always available. Um, you think it is, you take it for granted. I take it for granted, maybe I shouldn't be saying it in the more, well, you know what I mean. I mean, it, individual takes it for granted until your life depends on it. And then it starts becoming a real deal. Um, dust storms on Mars can last months. Dust storms in Iraq when I was there can last weeks. Uh, we went, I think two weeks once uh, with a dust storm just hanging over Baghdad while I was there. So. Uh, I've seen it firsthand and, and pretty hard to grow stuff with no light. So you do need to have supplemental lighting. You need to have an artificial source if you're going to try to deploy this throughout the world and which is what we're trying to do. So again, thinking about kind of that I'm out there by myself on a whole different planet. I depend on this food. What are the problems that could come up and bite me? Mars gives us a good one. The desert of Baghdad gives us a good one. When the sun's down, really hard to grow. So. Uh, that's it for today. Next time we're going to be talking about fungus and pest control is kind of the topic and the systems that we have in place, the tools that we have in place to help manage that and the ones that we're learning about. So I hope you tune in for that one. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe. Don't forget you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and on Patreon. In the meantime, everyone, this is The Real Martian. Out.